You don't need a reason to do what you do, but it's nice to have a good one in your back pocket. This week, we're talking about legitimation. It's in your introduction to religious studies, and it's coming up right now. At this point in the academic study of religion, we've looked at how society works. That's been our focus. And this has taken us to better understand classification, essentialism, structure, and habitus. Now we're going to look at how religion works. For earlier in the class, we were focusing on how society works so we can have a new appreciation of religion beyond popular definitions and um, claims about religion. Now that we have a more sophisticated understanding of religion and culture, we're going to look at how religion works and what it can teach us about what people do in society. We're gonna take a look at religion so we can better understand the things that human beings do, AKA culture. This week, we're gonna take a look, of course, at discourse, because discourse is that unit of power. Yes, it's ways of talking, ways of communicating, but as we've noted to build upon Martin's definition, we've said that discourse is expression with effect. We're gonna look at the expressions that people have that make an impact on the world around them. In particular, we wanna take a look at a new kind of discourse for our conversation that we're gonna call legitimation. Legitimation, simply put, is justification for what people do. We should also add, though, that legitimation is also justification for what people think they should do or what people say they should do. So when asked and people have to explain themselves, they're going to look to sources to legitimate their actions or perspectives or views on life. Legitimation is a powerful tool in bringing the world together and bringing communities together in cohesive social groups. And we're going to look at how this is done by examining or deconstructing the cultural toolbox that societies use to legitimate their actions and their boundaries. Take a look. The cultural toolbox is an invisible set of resources used by cultural groups in order to construct their society. So if you think about social construction, the cultural toolbox is the thing that people in a culture appeal to in order to build the world around them. Their habitus is premised upon these things. Um, and on the chart that you see in the video, you'll see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, boxes in each column. Uh, and there are three columns. I want you to go ahead and pause the video and copy down this chart. This actually goes along with um, Martin's discussion of the cultural toolbox, but I want you to follow along with me because we're going to not only define the terms that you see in that left-hand column, but we're also going to come up with examples actually from Christianity to help us understand um, how the cultural toolbox gets employed within a habitus. So go ahead and pause the video, copy this down. You can look to um, your textbook to find these as well. And then um, when you're ready to go, Let's uh, get back together and we'll take notes um, together. So to begin with, we have concepts, norms, and values. Concepts, norms, and values, uh, uh, it really refers to the ideas that people in a culture have um, and they share. Those are sort of baseline um, philosophies and ideas that people have and share um, as the bedrock or foundation to their culture. Another way of thinking about this is that these are the dispositions that people in society have, that they pride and privilege. So I'm gonna write down in this sort of definition box, dispositions and bedrock principles. Now, some of these definitions, I should say, as we go forward, are going to become clear as we juxtapose them with the other um, terms in our toolbox. So if you're kind of confused about why is this this and not that, um, just wait until we've completed all seven, and I think you're going to see uh, the distinctions between them. Also, you'll see them more clearly when we look at the examples together, as well as um, in your textbook. Then we have traditions, rituals, and practices. These are the activities that a group does in order to reify, um, affirm those dispositions, bedrock principles, and ideas that also uh, functions to bring society together. 
And I think what needs to be said is that uh, it brings the group together. In fact, these activities, the traditions, ritual, and practices, they make the group. So without these activities, things don't seem the same. Now, myths and stories are the narratives that people in a group tell themselves and that inform their actions, inform their ideas, inform their concepts, norms, and values, traditions, rituals, and practices. So these are the myths and stories that they narrate to teach themselves who they are and um, also to teach uh, people who are coming up in the group how to be in the group and how to be more affirmed within the group. This helps them inform and educate and teach and remind them of what matters most. Texts, I would say, are the sources of those myths and stories, traditions, rituals, and practices, concepts, norms, and values. Texts are sources of the above. And another word for, for text, especially in the context of religion, it's going to be scriptures, right? Um, I like to define these as the texts that people read that also seem to read them back because these texts often take a life of their own. Scriptures seem to take a life of their own. In Bergerian terms, in Peter Berger's terms, they become objectivized so that they are not just something that we construct ourselves, but we construct them and then we think, we forget that we made them up. These are sources that, but they first construct and then they appeal to, to legitimate or justify who they are, what they're about, what they're supposed to do. It informs their concepts, norms, and values, traditions, rituals, and practices, myths, and stories. It's the sources that contain all of that stuff, as well as the things that we are about to get to, including icons. Icons are symbols that are key to the group. Um, I'd even say metaphors. But really, uh, Martin will use icons as a way of uh, distinguishing um, written from non-written. So text often being written and icons being um, the sort of symbolic or graphic. Figures are the, these are your heroes. These are the um, exemplars, the people you look up to, all right? Um, these are the champions. Uh, and then lastly, we have ideologies. And ideologies are the, the sort of key philosophies Um, that justify um, and uh, result from the discourses that your group has. And I'm also going to say that they are also connected to power dynamics. They are um, structuring. What are the cultural norms and values of Christians? What are the dispositions or bedrock principles that Christians are all about? Forgiveness, right? That's a key concept, norm, or value. They're going to talk about uh, faith in Christ. They're going to talk about being saved. What are the cultural norms and values of Christians? What are the dispositions or bedrock principles that Christians are all about? That's supposed to say saved. Um, let's erase this. Saved, right? Salvation is key. It's valued in Christianity. Now, what are some of the traditions, rituals, and practices that Christians do, right? The activities that bring the group together, that if you saw a group of people doing these things, you'd be like, hey, that's a bunch of Christians over there. I would think about baptism, right? Similarly, communion or the Last Supper, Right? They reenact uh, Jesus' meal with his disciples. That's an important deal. That's the bread and the cup. Um, they're going to confess their sins. Right, Maybe like an altar call. This is another action that Christians will do where they go before God and say what they've done wrong and try to become right with God. That's an important thing. Now, let's move to myths and stories. Right, The narratives that Christians tell each other, tell their children, tell themselves to shape the group. Now here is where you're thinking about like all those Sunday school or Bible stories, right? Um, the crucifixion, right? Uh, the death of Jesus on the cross, 
the resurrection. Um, you might look to Hebrew Bible or Old Testament stories, um, the burning bush, right? Moses. And if you wanted to hear those stories and more, where would you go? Well, you would go to the texts, the scriptures, the sources of their identity, where all of this stuff is contained. This is particularly true in sort of modern culture that's premised upon the printing press. But all societies have cultural texts, cultural master texts or sources where they um, not only sort of... Uh, go to for inspiration, but also they seem to take a life of their own. Um, so where would Christians go for these kinds of insights? Certainly the Bible, but also prayer books. Um, they might also go to a hymnal, right? Song books. Um, so, uh, and, and praise and worship songs, right? Like, so, you know, maybe you go to a church that doesn't have song books, um, but you've seen people maybe on TV who are singing, they have their hands up in the air. Maybe they're looking at words on a screen. Um, maybe they're not even looking at words at all. Maybe they just all know the songs and they sing them together. And those songs provide inspiration. They go to those to get a sense of who they are and who they can be in their Christian identity. That would count as texts in our cultural toolbox. Maybe it's a movie. Maybe there's a favorite like Jesus movie that you watch in order to come to understand who you are and to get a sense of how you do this. That's fine. That counts as a text for our purposes as well. Now, when we talk about icons, now we're talking about um, symbols and metaphor. For example, the cross, right? I can draw this. What about, um, let's see if I can draw a dove here, right? A dove to, um, oh, that's not bad. A dove to sort of um, speak to the Holy Spirit. What about a fire to talk about the Holy Spirit? This comes from the story of um, Pentecost, okay? So these are all symbols one might have in order to think about their Christian identity. Maybe they wear it, maybe they have it on a shirt, maybe they uh, have it in the front of their church on a sign, maybe it's part of their branding. But these icons are things that people can look to and look through to get at the projected hidden essence of who they are. Let's look at figures. You can think of figures who are key in Christianity. I mean, Christ himself, right? All of the prophets, right? All of these teachers and sages. When a group says, here's who we are, and we follow their example, the people who are the exemplars, those are your figures. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about ideologies, because this gets, uh, this is probably the trickiest one of all of the, the ideas here. And ideologies, again, we're talking about philosophies related to power dynamics and the structuring of our society. If we're thinking about Christianity, here we might think about the idea of go tell the world, right? Evangelism. Um, so think about these seven terms. Think about how they relate and play around with your own examples. Because as you do that, you'll hone in on their differences and how they relate and how they relate to the other things we've been learning in our introduction to religious study. Um, so why is legitimation such a big deal? Legitimation seems to be at the core of how cultures um, create the boundaries of their societies. So if you think about a group of people, draw a circle around that group of people, and inside the circle you'll see people appealing to that cultural toolbox to not only make sense of who they are and why they're in that circle, what makes them all similar versus those who are on the outside, but it also is used to erect the wall around them that keeps people from coming into their group without permission. So the cultural toolbox is a way of creating boundaries between who's inside in a group, who's with us, and who's not us or even against us. I also wanna say that within the walls of that social group, within those boundaries, we see that those who use these tools well to legitimate what they're doing can carve out a place for themselves higher on the social ladder. This is what we mean by social hierarchy, that within a group, there's a sort of pecking order about those who have more value or more, um, as we might say from our previous chapters, privilege to do what they wanna do. And they, they have that because they're able to legitimate it with the sources that are um, agreed upon within the culture as valuable. 
The reason why they're agreed upon is because they are at the core of constructing and structuring the norms and values and morality of the people within that group. It's the right thing to do. Legitimation points you in the right direction and equips you to do the right thing. And within a group, no one's going to argue with you if you use that toolbox well. That's legitimation.